Good evening, everyone. I uh, want to go ahead and start this off because I don't want to take a lot of time. Uh, I want to start this off by first humbling myself to all of you who are listening or who will listen. And I want to just go ahead and throw myself on an altar right now before all of you and just let you know that there might be a chance that I say something uh, that is triggering or is uh, viewed as maybe um, uh, a trigger word that might... Um, what's the word, might inflame some frustrations. Uh, I really want to just go ahead and let you know that I am striving to be sincere in this series of lessons. And if I do say anything that triggers a frustration, I do apologize in advance. We are all striving to do the best that we can. And uh, this is my um, trying to contribute and trying to make forth an effort for change. This is the contribution to that and I want to bring uh, the giftings that I feel God has given me to the table, and that is through biblical teaching and cultural understanding. So that's what this is all about. And I want to just go ahead and say that I love my brothers and sisters, and I'm thankful for all of you who have talked with me and has helped me on this journey. I've been studying what I'm about to be teaching in a moment the past uh, two, maybe two and a half years, and uh, I've had a lot of good conversations with some close friends that are of different ethnic persuasions, and I'm thankful for their input and their help and understanding. Uh, and that's the contributions uh, of what this is tonight is far reaching. Uh, the uh, idea behind this is I want to put out 25 to 30 minute long videos. Uh, and the intention of this is I would like for people to have a video that they can possibly invite somebody over to their house who has had a different cultural background than them and put this video on a computer, spend 20 minutes watching it, and then afterwards eating a meal and discussing it uh, civilly over, over a meal and having true biblical communication. That is the intention of this, and that's what I want to provide. So in the future, I will be providing, um, as the weeks go on, I'll be providing actually handout sheets that you can download for free. And it'll just help to have the conversation. So without further ado, I want to go ahead and start. I'm going to put up a 20-minute countdown. And tonight I want to talk about, in this first lesson, uh, the paradigm shift. So, first thing I want to do is I want to read the scripture uh, from Matthew 25. It says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on His right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by the Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. Verse 36 says, I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous, I want to highlight that word, the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? The king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. In this passage of scripture, we're clearly seeing that there is a melding together of the king and his people, that they are one and the same, that when you reach out and touch somebody and love on them, you have effectively reached out and touched and loved on God. And this passage will be the theme of this series, and I admonish every one of you to read this and familiarize yourself with it as passionately as you do our scriptures on salvation, because this is part of our salvation. We were saved for a reason. We are saved for the relationship with God and man so that we could be in relationship with him, but also so that we can be in right relationship with each other. And this passage is loaded with a lot of ancient concepts that were already established in the Old Testament. So the original hearers here in Matthew 25, their minds would have been exploding with a lot of ancient things they had been raised on, whereas you and I may have to catch up with them and understand the cultural background to really get where their minds were when they originally heard it. And that's what I want to do in this uh, series of lessons in the future is help us to pick up or actually leave our Western baggage at the door and pick up an Eastern concept so that we can understand what this Eastern Jesus was saying, especially uh, what he was intending when he made 
when he made this statement, the righteous in verse 37. So to really grasp what Jesus was saying fully, we need to acclimate our minds to the culture and what came along with those words, the righteous. So the biblical word for righteousness is tzedakah. And it's a little bit more specific than maybe what you think it means. Uh, tzedakah is an ethical standard that refers to right relationships between people. It is about treating others as the image of God with the God-given dignity that they deserve. Tzedakah was the biblical standard of right relationship between all people. But the question is what do we do to become tzedakah or righteous? What is the process to attaining righteousness? Well, the word mishpat is one I want you to familiarize yourself with, for that is the word for justice. Mishpat is the actions one would take to create the standard of tzedakah. Mishpat can refer to retributive justice, like if I steal something, then I pay the consequences. That is retributive justice. Yet, most often in the Bible, this is what I want you to listen to really closely. Mishpat, it refers to restorative justice. Uh, over 400 times that you see the word mishpat, 90% of those 400 instances is referencing to restoration and not retribution. Now, we have to focus on the retribution because that is a reality as well. And if it's the, in the Bible, then we must pay attention to it. But of the 400 instances that you see mishpat or justice, 90% of those times it is referring to restoration. It is uh, people who would go a step further. They would seek out vulnerable people and then set out to uh, restore them. They would seek out people who were being taken advantage of and they would lend a helping hand. Uh, there's often a, a phrase attached to mishpat. It was those who spoke on behalf of those who could not speak on their own. Some would call this charity. That is a, a word that is linked to justice. Uh, to see a biblical example, I want to read a passage from Job. And to give you the context, Job has gone through calamity and he's reminiscing back to his life before his world was changed by, by his uh, day of calamity. It says, Because I delivered the poor who cried for help and the fatherless who had none to help him, the blessing of him who was about to perish came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on sedekah, and it clothed me. My mishpat was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy, and I searched out the cause of him whom I did not know. I broke the fangs of the unrighteous and made him drop his prey from his teeth. Here Job is saying, the life that I lived before, I was a righteous man and I was a just man because I sought out the needs of the widow. I sought out the needs of those who I didn't even know. I spoke on behalf of those who did not have a voice. To show this kind of generosity that Job is referencing here, it would declare a person to be a Sadiq. It was the adjective. If you lived out through action, mishpat, then they would have called you a Sadiq or a righteous person. And Job was reminiscing of how he advocated for these vulnerable people. And he said, I put on sedekah. I put on righteousness. It was like my clothing. And I put upon my head justice, like a turban. And I'll explore in the next lesson uh, some of the 400 instances where we see justice and righteousness. I won't explore all of them, but I will give you enough to see that this is the, one of the largest biblical themes all throughout the Bible. And it holds a huge impact on the life of Jesus. And if we don't get the cultural understanding, we will not fully grasp the beauty of what Jesus did in his ministry. So I want to look at Matthew 22, uh, 22 verse 34. I want to transition to a paradigm shift that Jesus is instituting here. It says, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Here, Jesus' response would not have been surprising at all in verse 37, because he quotes to these religious people, the Shema. 
And they said, what is the great commandment? He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Uh, you shall love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And these self-righteous, uh, their own righteousness, they were probably patting themselves on the back and saying, well, that's real good. That's Deuteronomy 6.4. We pray that prayer every single day. And in the moment, as Jesus was telling them this, they were saying, okay, we are, we are fulfilling the law. We're doing the greatest commandment by loving the Lord our God. We know that he is one God according to Deuteronomy 6.4. And we're praying this prayer and we are striving to love him. But Jesus shifts the paradigm. And he says, but wait, there is one like it. That word like in the Greek is like, uh, it's referencing to a mirror. There is a mirror image to this law you've been fulfilling, loving the Lord your God. The second one, and he quotes Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19 said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus was effectively doing what he did in Matthew 25. He was melding together the relationship with God equal to the relationship with man. You shall love the Lord your God first. And when you do this, then you should be able to love your neighbor. And it was in this moment that their paradigm shifted because they were now seeing something for the first time. They were thinking to themselves, okay, we've been loving God. But then God says, if you really love that God, you will love his image as well, mankind. You will speak on his behalf. You will advocate for him. If you truly love me, then you will truly love them. And Jesus was inaugurating a paradigm shift right here. And then he further offends them by saying, upon these two hang all the law and the prophets. What he was saying there, and I'll discuss this more next week, but he was saying that upon these two was the entire point of the law and the prophets. The, the point of the law that I gave Moses on Mount Sinai was to have relationship with God and relationship with man. In fact, there were five uh, uh, in the Ten Commandments that dealt with the relationship between God and man, and then the other five dealt with the relationship between man and man. This was their peace treaty and their constitution of a new-natured people. And right here, Jesus is shifting the paradigm. Now, I want to explain to you what a paradigm is so that you understand the nature of this first lesson. A paradigm theory is a general theory that helps to provide scientists working on a particular field with their broad theoretical framework. It provides them with their basic assumptions, their key concepts, and their methodology, and it sets before them their goal that they're trying to achieve. An example of a paradigm would be Ptolemy's uh, geocentric model of the universe. Um, before Ptolemy introduced his theory, the paradigm was that the Earth was at the center of the universe. Well, Ptolemy, after much research, Ptolemy was a priest in uh, the 1500s, his name was Nicholas, um, uh, Ptolemy had this, this theory, but in 1515, rather, Nicholas Copernicus come along and he said that there was, uh, there was a paradigm shift that the sun was at the center of the universe. And in 1515, he got this revelation, but he was afraid to say anything because he knew he would be excommunicated because this went against everything that they held true and dear. And he was afraid to speak on this. And it wasn't until 1545 or 1543, rather, that this paradigm began to shift to the perspective of Nicholas Copernicus. And they introduced that the sun was at the center of the universe. They, they were taking apart Ptolemy's uh, paradigm and it was shifting towards Copernicus. And what happened here is an entire group of people started to see that this old way of thinking was wrong and they had to adopt a new way of thinking in order to advance forward in astronomy. But here's the thing. Copernicus did not speak from 1515 until 1543 because of fear to be excommunicated. He died not long after he wrote about this, uh, this new paradigm. People saw it. They were willing to adopt his way of view, but they were afraid to say anything for fear of heresy. This is a paradigm shift. And what you will see in history is every time a new paradigm that challenges an old paradigm is introduced, there is friction and it's an instant rejection because they are saying, no way, this, does, this goes against everything we have ever heard, everything we've ever held dear. And they reject it at first until they can collect enough evidence to overturn their old paradigm. And then they're left with two options. They can either hold on to what they've always held true and dear and reject this new paradigm, even, all, even though all evidence says that that old paradigm is obsolete. And they just stay in a religious state or they can accept a new paradigm because the evidence lines up and it is true and they can advance forward. I will put it to you this way. <clears throat> Without this paradigm shifting, 
We wouldn't even have space travel today if we still adopted Ptolemy's old way of thinking because of a paradigm shift. And Jesus is doing that. And here's the thing that I want to tell you. We are in a paradigm shift right now and we're feeling friction and we're going and we're collecting data and we're saying, okay, I need enough data to say, we don't need enough data to say that killing somebody is wrong. We don't need any more data to say that racism is wrong. That is clear the writings on the wall. What we need is we need a biblical definition of how to go forward. We need to start collecting evidence from Bible to tell us how do we move forward with humanity. A paradigm has to shift. So as modern Westerners, I want to shift your paradigm right now. As modern Westerners, when we think of justice and we think of fairness, <clears throat> we ask, what is fair? Is this fair? This is the way we think as Westerners. And justice is a positive word, especially when we claim to have justice on our side. And this is what's going on in our nation right now. It seems like one particular group has more justice on their side than the other. And we need to address this. Truth is, however, that justice is very confused. It's a very confused word in our modern Western society. We all want justice, but we don't all agree on what constitutes justice. How you define what is just and unjust is not inherently obvious to each of us. It comes through a set of religious dogmas or world values that says this is right and that is wrong. But the thing is, we all have varying opinions on what is right and what is wrong. So Michael Sandel, who is a Harvard Law professor and author of the book called Justice, What's the Right Thing to Do? He says this, modern Western, the modern Western world lives in a very confused state because we all cry for liberty and justice. Yet we have a subculture that has different uh, core values that define differently what that just thing is. So he boils it down to three categories. The first category is the maximizing welfare view. What will bring the greatest amount of good and reduce the greatest amount of harm for the greatest number of people? What this core value, however, does not address is what is the greatest good, nor does it define what is harm. This view, maximizing welfare view, is often connected to socialism. So that's one part of our Western society. They, they, they want to find what, will, what is going to provide the most good for the most amount of people while reducing the greatest amount of harm. But then there's a second view. The second view is the respecting freedom view. This is about individual liberty. Justice in this view focuses on what is the greatest amount of respect for the individual freedoms to live how they want to live. This view is deeply rooted in American history and culture. Think of the phrase, don't tread on me. This is often connected to libertarianism. So now we have two views that make up the Western world. And then to make things even worse, we add a third view that makes up the American mindset. It's the promoting virtue view. Justice is what shapes the society to act as though they ought to act in accordance with moral virtue. There is a vision that humans ought to behave this way. There is an agreement on what those virtues are. And the society will be just when they are pushing people towards those virtues. This view lines up closely, most closely, to the biblical viewpoint. However, there are wide varying opinions on what moral values are. This is where we get different religions and denominations of religions. This is often connected to conservatism. These three viewpoints, this is what makes up the whole of the Western world. And I'm going to hone in on North America. These three views make up the whole viewpoint of North America. So to put this into context, these three ideas comprise all of, of mankind within the confines of the North American borders. Each one has a vastly different view of what is just and what is fair. It's no wonder that we struggle to agree because these are three completely different viewpoints of what is just or fair. It becomes very important for us as Christians to check these views at the door. All right, this is the paradigm shift I'm going to throw at you. We need to check these three views at the door, and we need to ask what is biblical. I'm talking to Christians right now. I'm not trying to make this fit into the world. I'm trying to speak this to Christians. We need to check these three views at the door, and we need to proceed forward with what does the Bible tell us, okay? These three uh, viewpoints are, are important to understand, because it gives us a revelation of why we don't agree. 
why the whole of America is not in agreement. Where there should be agreement is in the church. I cannot speak on behalf of the entire nation because here's the bottom line, sinners sin. But I can speak on behalf of the church. We need to come into agreement and we need to check those three viewpoints at the door. And here's why. Because you are not a Republican. You are redeemed. You are not a Democrat. You are a disciple. Check that at the door. And we need to ask what Bible says. That is what we're striving to do. What does the Bible say? Because America does not fit into this Bible. This Bible does not, this is not an American Bible. This is a kingdom Bible. And we need to ask, what does the kingdom say about this? These three viewpoints have become even more compounded and convoluted at the introduction of social media. Social media is now taking these three viewpoints and it's smashing it into a news feed. And you can scroll and you can see varying opinions and then you get confused. Well, yeah, I agree with the libertarianism. I agree with the socialist view or I agree with the conservative view. And then you get confused. You need to check those views at the door as a Christian and you need to ask what the Bible says about these things. And that is what this series of lessons is going to achieve. We need to ask, what does the Bible say about the injustices that's going in the world? And I want to show you what Bible says and why I'm making these videos and why I have been vocal. Because true justice, biblical, biblical justice, when you study it, you cannot see it any other way. It is speaking on behalf of the vulnerable. It's important that we balance this thought out, that we as born-again Christians align ourselves with the reality that we are citizens of heaven. Donald Trump is not your king. Jesus is. Barack Obama is not our king. Jesus is. According to the Bible, we obey the laws of the land. I agree with all those things. You can see that in the book of Peter. You can see that in Romans. You can see all of that. However, in terms of social injustices, we need to take a step back and we need to not look at those three viewpoints that make up the whole of America. We need to look at the kingdom viewpoint of America. I will just give you a, a snippet of one of the last lessons I've written in this series. Jesus came and spoke on our behalf as Gentiles. And Paul said, you wouldn't even have any inheritance in this whole salvation thing if Jesus did not come and advocate for you. I will let that burrow into your soul and let you determine what that says about how we should respond right now. When Jesus taught of the kingdom in his earthly ministry, he uses present tense verbs declaring that he was the kingdom that had arrived. He was not speaking in the future tense. He was looking at him and said, fellas, the kingdom is here. And then when the church was filled with his spirit, we brought the kingdom to earth, representing our king in this body, the spirit flowing through us. We were invited into the kingdom through the new birth experience, according to John 3, 5. We see that experience being activated. The, the church was formed, the Eve, the second Eden rather, uh, or the second Eve was formed in the side on Calvary, but she was given the breath of life in Acts 2, and when she resurrected, she was an advocate. And what? why Why do we not quote this enough? They were filled with the Spirit, as we see in Acts 2.38, but then when you move down, you then see that they sold, gave to one another, had all things common. This was getting the relationship with man right after getting the relationship with them and God right. They were reaching out. This is what we're intended to see. Are we being the kingdom? The paradigm shift that I want to introduce in this first lesson is that America is wonderful. It has obviously been blessed by God. The favor of God has obviously been on North America. But do all of America's ideals line up with Bible? Sadly, no. So we can be a patriot, we can be a part of America and not agree with all of its ideals. And we can adopt a biblical mindset and we can progress forward. And where we are is we're in the paradigm shift where people are hearing this and they're rejecting it. I already can tell somebody's going to watch this video and think that I am anti-America. There's going to be some military family who is going to be offended by this. And I am not saying that America is the devil. I am not saying that. I am saying that America is run by people that are not following the kingdom. We are of a different kingdom. We are a blood-bought kingdom. We are a blood. We have been introduced into a new kingdom. We're citizens of a different world. And though we live in America, we can love America. We can pray for America. We can represent ourselves well in America. We are of a different kingdom. And the paradigm is shifting right now. And it's going to be uncomfortable. And people are going to reject it at first until they can collect enough evidence. And my intention with these series is to show you the evidence so that your paradigm can shift. 
So we need to establish the mindset of what is just in the kingdom. That's what we're seeking out. What is just in the kingdom? The biblical definition of justice, a.k.a. mishpat, is connected to love, mercy, and humility. You will always see these connected together. Mercy is about looking on people who are in difficult situations. This is what mercy is. If I act in their favor and do good to them, then that's called mercy. Humility is very similar as it, it's me treating someone else as more important than myself. That's the definition of humility. I make, hear this, I make their problems my problems. Justice is, in a nutshell, making other people's problems my problems. That is the biblical. You cannot argue that, and I will show it to you to where you have enough evidence to shift your paradigm. Justice is making somebody else's problem your problem. That is what Job was saying. He said, I went and made the widow's problem my problem. I went and made the poor's problem my problem. Today, we need to look around and see where the problem is and get involved in making those problems our problems. That is biblical justice. While doing it in a Christian manner. I'll let you explore those things out. I'm not going to direct you in any way because I don't want you to I don't want you to be swayed by my opinion. I will give you biblical evidence only. So I'm going to refrain from saying anything I think. And I will just let you explore these words. And I'm going to leave this lesson right here with this scripture. Psalm 146, put not your trust in princes in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever. Listen to this. Who executes, here it is, mishpat for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, the Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the tzedakah. The Lord watches over the sojourners. That's the immigrant, by the way. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. This is the biblical definition of what is just. This. This is, when we are just, it leads us on a road to being Sadiq or being a righteous person. Study this out. I'm going to be dropping in my newsfeed when we're going to be doing the second lesson. I don't want these to be much longer because I want you to, to watch these with somebody and have conversation. That is all for this week. And like I said, I will give you the update on the next lesson and I will explore the Old Testament and show you. And hopefully you will get enough evidence to shift your paradigm. That is all I have. I love all of you and I pray that this is a blessing. Take care and I'll see you on the next video.